Welcome to the HR Dialogues. I'm your host, Dr. Dieter Feltzmann, and today we will be discussing business and HR transformation and how we can look at organizational design and culture in terms of creating customer and client-centric organizations. Welcome to the HR Dialogues, where we learn from people practitioners as they navigate the emerging world of work. I'm joined today by Claire Bonifa from SD3. And Claire, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dieter, uh, for inviting me to share my experience with you today. I'm very uh, excited about this conversation. No, same to the side as well. And I think to get us started before we jump right in, I think we can acknowledge that over the past couple of years, business and HR transformation has been a very big topic for a lot of HR professionals and practitioners. I think, unfortunately, the feedback that we get from the market is that a lot of culture transformation, business transformation initiatives don't really deliver on what was initially planned um, in terms of what we want to achieve with regards to that. Today, Claire, we'd love to tap into some of your expertise around driving some of these journeys as well. And to get us started, give us a little bit of a background around your role as well as the role that you play in SD3 and set the scene for us as we dive uh, straight into your transformation journey. Sure, thanks. So first of all, S3 is a global uh, staffing organization and we specialize uh, in STEM talent. So we actually connect talent in science, technology, engineering and mathematics with organization, mainly for contracts, so Mm -hmm. for flex jobs. Um, And uh, personally, I'm the country leader for S3 in France. So I lead the S3 operation in France for all of its brands. And I've joined S3 14 years ago, so it's a long time in Amsterdam, actually. Um, and I've been working in uh, in Brussels as well in, in different roles. Um, so, yeah, it's been also a change journey for myself. So, yeah. <laughs> I can definitely imagine that. And, and Claire, take us, take us back four or five years where our story yeah. today starts, really, around where was the organization at the time? What were some of the challenges that you were facing there? And, and bring us into this world around what you were trying to solve for. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, So indeed, four years ago, um, I was asked by uh, the company uh, leadership to conduct an audit of the French operations uh, because the company was facing different challenges. We had uh, difficulty to achieve our ambition in terms of target, in terms of financial ambition, Mm -hmm. but also commercial ambition. And what I found that while I was doing the audit is that the uh, employee and the customer experience were really not that great. Um, And that uh, led to uh, a lot of people who were leaving the organization and a struggle to actually attract the right talent. Um, we had some great people in the organization, but they couldn't really unleash their potential. And as a result, uh, we were really uh, actually demotivating the individuals we had on site. So we had to change something drastically to make sure we were actually improving customer and employee experience at the same time so that it would impact financial and commercial performance. I like the fact that you immediately mentioned the relationship between customer experience and employee experience. I think, you know, in a, from a theoretical point of view, we always talk about the fact that we know that these two things are so closely related. And yet I find in a lot of organizations in practice, they still seem to be pretty separate. You know, almost employee experience sits in the domain of you know, kind of your HR teams and customer or client experience sits a lot more in the domain of your marketing or your product teams as part of that. What led you right from the get-go from an audit point of view to want to understand understand this holistic picture? Was there a particular yeah. driver for you then? Yeah, I mean, it's obvious, but we are a service organization. So everything we sell actually is based on the quality of the people we have on board in the organization. We don't have a product. We are really here to connect talent and organization. So it was evident that if people were valued in their work, were satisfied and also could make meaning to what they were doing, so they were aligned to the company strategy and to the company overall ambition, that they would actually be delivering a great experience to candidate and customer. And for me, there is a strong link in uh, here with empowerment. Mm-hmm. If you feel really empowered to deliver on the company mission and purpose, then you will deliver a great experience to your client and candidates. And uh, you will only be able to do that if you feel trusted. Mm-hmm. So this is where the connection came in. You know, If people felt trusted and felt they could really deploy their talent and they could really be themselves at work, then they would positively impact customer experience. Mm. There's two words that you mentioned that I absolutely love. I think the first one is is empower because we're seeing a lot of talk at the moment around um, 
you know, we want to co-create with employees, but that means they have to be empowered to also have the agency to change things or to give suggestions and to provide input and, and um, that actually gets actioned. And the other one is meaning, because I think there's a very strong notion at the moment from a talent point of view. If I don't find meaning in my job, if I don't know where I fit yeah. and why I fit, I think that immediately kind of sets you off the wrong path um, with regards yeah. to thinking about transformation. So Claire, talk to us, what did your audit find? Um, and what were some of those things that you then immediately said, but these are the things that's the barriers towards where we want to go as an organization? Yeah. So what we found out is that we had great foundation. You know, when we look back at why the company was funded and what service was promises to clients, there was nothing wrong with it. You know, we had a great purpose. We had a good vision. But where we failed was on the strategy uh, implementation. I think it's the case for many organizations. And we also didn't have the right culture to deliver on our purpose. And practically what it was is that we had too many hierarchical levels, you know, between the people in front of the customer and the person who were making decisions, sometimes there were six different hierarchical levels. So actually it was very difficult for people to feel empowered, as you said. We also had um, a reward structure that was not aligned to a strategic direction. So it, we were not rewarding the right behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, of, of course, as a result, you know, we led people to having the wrong behaviors for organization and for our customers. Uh, we also realized that um, a lot of our people didn't understand the connection between what they were doing on a daily basis and the company purpose. So we were not emphasis enough uh, time or we were not spending enough time really explaining the purpose and helping people to connect with it. So all of this together uh, really uh, was evident that we had to do something very uh, different and to really engage all of the staff in the transformation and not just do it like a side project mm. or something you do uh, just with some HR leaders and company leaders, but that it really needed to come from everybody in the organization. I definitely think that whole systems change approach is the way to go when you really want to almost start changing the identity of who a company is, right? And how yeah. the company shows up and really to be able to align people and really rally the troops around the purpose of the organization. Yeah. It's interesting. We find at the moment that the word purpose is used a lot more in organizations than it was ever before. And I think it does point towards this real conversation pertaining to if I'm talent, why do I want to spend my time there? What's in it for me? Yeah. Um, does it matter where I actually fit? Claire, what's interesting for me around the point that you make is that almost immediately from the get-go, you were taking a very holistic picture around how the different things connect to each other. And I think that's a mistake we often make. You know, people say, oh, it's the design that's not working. Let me fix the design. But they don't then account also for the reward structures that are in place or the leadership styles that we put in place. Talk to me a little bit about your your idea there to connect the organizational design component with some of these other elements that doesn't necessarily always live in the same world. What led you towards yeah. that, that approach? Yeah, first of all, I want to say I have a lot of empathy for people who don't dare to approach all of this together because it's quite scary, you mm. know, to, to say that I'm going to touch on reward and organizational design and on culture all at the same time. People can think you're crazy, you mm. know, if you do that all at the time. So I really have a lot of empathy for that. But why I uh, was able to push for all of this together is that um, I was convinced that if we actually only if we are too shy with the change we are driving, we will not send a strong enough message that we are serious about what we want to achieve, that we are serious about the transformation we want to lead. And I also think that transformation, in France at least, is, is very often negatively perceived. So when you speak to employees about we need to transform the organization, then they, they think of layoff. You know, yes. okay, we're going to have to let a lot of people go. So I really needed to send a lot of positive message and be very concrete about actually, no, we talk about organizational design, we talk about reward, we talk about job design, we talk about uh, how we serve our clients, how we organize our teams. We're not talking about layoff, we're not talking mm -hmm. about cost control. So we had to also make sure that it was very clear what we were working on. So this is why I, I really wanted to be... Um, looking at all of these aspects together. Um, and the way we started is uh, by really being honest as well with the people around the results of the audit that I conducted. Yep. So we, from the beginning, have been very transparent around this is what's working and this is what's not working and this is what we need to address. And because we had this transparent conversation from the beginning, it was easier to approach all of these points together. Mm. 
No, I can definitely see the value of that. And I think you also mentioned the fact that, you know, transparent and authentic positioning of why we are doing this often makes um, the difference. Because in my own experience, you know, I think organizational design on the one end, usually, unfortunately, it does carry that label that a lot of people believe it's about layoffs, it's about cutting things, it's mm. about a very fearful and a very unsettling process within the organization where Org design doesn't doesn't have to be that. It can be a very enabling process and it can be a very enabling thing within the organization that's continuously running. But I do think, you know, it's like that bad reputation that it's picked up over yeah. the years um, as part of that as well. Yeah, and something that we've done, and I think that worked quite well to actually overcome that negative feeling, is that we really tried to bring the outside in the organization. So we really shared a lot of stories from other organizations that had done some positive transformation. We talked about alternative ways to organize teams. We talked about organizations that had different governance to actually show them it was possible, we could do something positive without it's important without promising we will copy what other companies do. But it was super important as well for us to inspire our people to look for more positive outcome and different ways of working. Um, and that was quite a lot of time investment at the beginning to make sure that it was not only me or a few leaders who were convinced we had to change and convinced there was another possible way, but building that collective uh, thinking that we could do something different and it actually exists very positively with a lot of success in other organization was very important for all individuals. I really like the fact that also around bringing the outside in also means that you acknowledge that they are other organizations that are doing other innovative things. I sometimes yeah. find that organizations tend to close their doors very quickly and say, you know what, we will figure it out in our way. Um, and I don't want to share with the rest of the world where I know the agile movement is quite famous for the fact that a lot of organizations that have experimented with that actually open their doors and say, you know, come and learn from us. We've made mistakes. Don't make the same mistake that we did. And I firmly believe that that's the way to go for the future around us almost learning from our broader ecosystem, if you want to call it that, of other organizations that have walked similar paths but putting our own flavor on it because context is important. And I think of every course. single organization's context is going to be be slightly different. Yeah, Claire, you spoke about bringing people along. I, I would um, really like to understand because I, <laughs> I know at the beginning of a change process, you know, we always talk about leadership alignment. It sounds like you even had to go further than that, almost to align the whole yeah. and rally the whole organization behind this initiative. So how did you go about that? Yeah, it was super important for us because we didn't want it to be a management project. We really wanted it to be a company old project. So the way we did it was with different steps and uh, with a lot of patience, I have to say, because it's an important element. We actually um, started to, to, as I said, share the results of the audit, you know, be very transparent mm -hmm. and honest about the company situation, about what's working, what's not working, and also uh, showing clearly the gap between what's expected of the organization and what's being delivered. Um, sometimes we are afraid of being honest with people around the companies not doing so well because we are afraid they're going to become maybe insecure. But I think people become insecure when they lack information. So we actually uh, brought a lot of information to them, educated them as well on financial metrics, commercial metrics, because some of them didn't know how to understand those numbers. So that's the first thing we've done. Then we, as I said, build a collective um, belief that we could mm. do something differently by indeed uh, uh, interviewing other organizations, but also using what's out there. You know, your, your, your podcast is a great example of how easily you can get inspiration. So we organize sessions where we listen podcasts and then we had a debate around, okay, what did you learn from it? What did you enjoy from it? Um, we went to events together. So it's not that complicated to do. It mm. just takes time. And then from that, we had uh, two, two main um, ways to engage staff. The first one is is we asked uh, uh, the top 30% of our organization to list all problems, all pain points in the organization. What are the barriers that people are facing to deliver better experience to customers but to, and to have a better experience as an employee? From that, we listed 10 priorities that needed to be worked on. So that was one thing. And these 10 priorities became 10 projects that we opened to all employees and we asked employees to volunteer to work on these projects and to come up with solutions. 60% of our staff signed up for one of these projects. I was really surprised. It was 
amazing, honestly, really amazing. And the other thing we've done is we built a project team uh, with volunteers and we took uh, on purpose also people, we approached on purpose people that we knew were detractors of the change. So we had detractors, champions and advocates, and maybe some people were a bit more neutral in the group to work on the new organizational design. So people from all level. And with this group of people, we actually spend a lot of time explaining them what's possible, what exists, uh, what's working with the model we have, what's not working, and really engaging with the purpose mm -hmm. of the organization and our key operating principle, because it's super important to make sure your organizational design is actually delivering on your purpose. So we had those two streams. So the 10 project teams uh, from the, I mean, really based on staff volunteering into the project. And we had the org design group that worked all together. And each of these stream had clear deadlines to meet. And we had uh, agreed upfront on how we're going to assess proposal from each of these streams. So they had to, they had deadlines to meet, proposed solution. We had defined a clear framework on how we're going to assess the solution, when we're going to give feedback and so on. So uh, this is how we actually engage the staff in it. I think it's great also the involvement that you had around, you know, I always find the, the view from the top of an organization and the view from the from the bottom is very, very different. And I think definitely <laughs> from a organizational design point of view, um, I've always found it extremely useful to you know, go and ask the people that really work with the customers day to day or that really sit in the operations of the organization around what are those barriers and what are those pain points. Um, I think especially in the type of business that you're in a service dri driven business, that is so important because your product yeah. is really, you know, kind of the intangible components that also happen between those relationships. How did you inspire people to want to do this? Because you've admitted, you know, it's, it's scary. Change is scary. Organizational design is scary. Transformation is very, very scary. How did you manage to really inspire people? You've mentioned stories. We've kind of connected with people outside as well. But how did you really get them to connect to that purpose? Yeah, so first of all, I think uh, the mass, vast majority of people want to be proud of what they do. So if you touch into that and you explain them that your aim is to help them to be prouder of the work they deliver to customer, then it's easier for them to connect. So that's one thing is really being very clear and explicit around, for example, if we able to um, simplify uh, the approval process to mm. give extra discounts to client and that you will be able to make those decisions by yourself, how will you feel, you know, being very concrete and doing scenarios like this? Like, well, I will feel really, I will I save some time. Then I can respond to my clients straight away. Then I feel empowered. Uh, yeah, of course, I would be more proud. So really having those very concrete examples to illustrate what it could potentially look like, you know, what good looks like in the future. And then the other things we've done is really... Um, um, uh, listening, as you said, to our customers as well and bringing the voice of our customer in the organization because our customers were telling us, you need to change something, you know? It, and just connecting that with the, the feedback as well from the employees because we, as many organizations, we do employee survey and so on. It really helped to build the need for change and the fact that people wanted to get involved in it. And the last point I talked about many, many times with them, and I'm not sure it will translate well in English, you have to tell me, it's employability. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's something I talk to them a, a lot around. It's quite unique to leave such a transformation in an organization. You may not get this opportunity many times in your career. And that means that if you do that with us and if you really engage in the transformation, you will make your profile more attractive on the market. It will create opportunities for you, of course, within S3, mm -hmm. but it will also create opportunities for you outside S3 if you wish to leave one day. And that was super important to really explain to them what are the concrete competencies you're going to develop while we do this, you know, in this change process. I think that's quite a bold move there. And I absolutely <laughs> love it around the fact that you can also be very real in terms of that conversation with, with people, because I think you're absolutely correct. Sometimes some of the most difficult processes and, you know, journeys within organizations are those that you learn the most from. And that does make you really attractive for that next step in your career as well. Yeah. Um, I think it was great that you were able to talk to that, but on the other side, also make it extremely practical and real for people, which again, for me, I think it's a very unique approach that you took to almost not just sell the end state of what is the transformation and the, the kind of new organization look like, but there's also some benefits and some value during the course of the process, even though it might be, might be kind of tough. Yeah. 
Claire, what surprised you the most out of this journey um, when you when you embarked on it? Something that, that happened that you did not expect? Yeah. Um, so the first thing that happened that I didn't expect is a high level of uh, participation into the project. You know, 60% of the staff, I really didn't expect it. So that was the first surprise. Uh, and then I had a second surprise one year into the project when we had the first draft of the new organizational design. So we had defined the target, what we mm -hmm. want to aim for. And we had moved a lot of the project. So we had actually delivered on a lot of the solution proposed by the staff. I presented the target organization to uh, the complete organization and I didn't expect, I didn't foresee such a pushback from the first line managers. Okay. And it was really naive to have to say for myself because indeed, you know, the new organization we presented was without line managers. It was really based on shared governance, shared responsibility. We had managers, but in a different way, more like leaders, inspiring leaders. Uh, but we were completely changing the way people were rewarded in this leadership position. So, of course, the most impacted people were the first line managers. And they really um, built some kind of a revolution, you know, kind of a riot against us. Also, we are in France, so there is a lot of uh, <laughs> history around that. Um, and I didn't expect it would be so strong, their response. Um but what I've learned from that is uh, to really go back into active listening uh, posture. So to really listen, trying to understand what are the fears, what are the concerns, uh, what uh, are the potential development uh, support they need to be able to engage with that change and give them time and that space to really express all of this with us. Um, so I've learned a lot from it. I didn't expect it. So it slowed down a bit the process, but probably it was for the best because in the end it gave us a chance to really engage that population more specifically, but it was clearly not something I've had foreseen. Yeah. I think there's also, for me, change journeys is almost like a game of chess. Um, you know, you almost move <laughs> a piece and then you have to see what does your, uh, the, the person you're playing with actually do on the other side and then you have to respond in kind. Something that I can imagine was quite a, a challenge is for that first line group of managers is, is loss of status, loss of, yeah. of ego, loss of power. Um, how did you help engage them with that to also paint the picture for them around what how this would be different, um, you know, post that first session? Yeah, it was. So there are two things. So first of all, it's really projecting on the long term and creating that vision outside the organization. So I was really clear with them that whether they like it or not, this is the way uh, the future of work is going, you know, and actually um, controlling managers will not exist in the future and no one will want to work with them anymore. So they have to change and they have to embrace that change. If they don't want to do it now, fine, they can leave it, of course, up to them, but uh, they will have to do it later in another organization for sure. So I really reinforce that message. And then the second thing I've done is giving them time. Mm -hmm. So I said, as long as you're committing to, to develop yourself, to move toward that direction, and that you really make steps every day to go toward that direction, you take on feedback, you act on the feedback you receive, then I'm fine. I don't need you to change overnight. There is no deadline that you need to meet to become that inspiring leader, to let go of certain privilege or certain uh, aspect of your job, as long as you make progress. So this was really a contracting conversation. Like you will have to get there as long as you are uh, committing to this and we are clear on both sides that you are making progress and you get the right support to do that, then I'm fine with it. Um, I have to say that immediately, I think one or two said, well, no, not for me. I will be leaving, which is fine. And then uh, I think six, nine months later, later, we also had a couple of people who actually exited at that time because they realized it was too much of a gap for them or it was not the, the role they enjoyed the most. So um, yes, you will lose people in, in a transformation like this. You will lose potential talent, but it's uh, also, um, I think, something that is necessary to, to really make sure people understand you're very serious about the change and you really want a new culture to be embraced, embraced in the organization. And I think that's such an important point that you mentioned there around the fact that people and I think sometimes we underestimate that people have to cognitively buy into something and actually make a decision to say, you know, yeah. yes, I want to be here. I will do that. Um, what I love about your approach is I think, and this might sound very controversial, but it was a, 
was kind of two peers talking around the table, you know, the organization and the managers around where we want to go in the future, yeah. as opposed to more of a, you know, instruct, I tell you what the future is going to look like. You just need to comply because I, th I don't think that's how you change people's behavior um, at all. And I love the fact that there was this contracting conversation around, let's be clear on expectations. Let's make sure that there's enough time for you to shift towards that, but you have to put in the effort and you have to put in the work to be able to do that yeah. as well. Example, maybe from my side, I was part of an organizational turnover around and we had this huge campaign around count me in where employees actually had to say I'm in for the transformation journey I want to be here I know it's going to be tough um, I also love the fact you know I think the realization that yes there will be some people that don't opt in that actually say you know this is no longer the place for me and I think sometimes in transformation journeys we are so fearful that that happens that we actually don't clearly state what the future is going to look like and there's all these sorts of compromises that almost clouds the waters around what the future would really, really be. Um, Claire, for those that opted in, for those that said, I am going to develop, I am going to move forward, um, how did you manage the journey for them? Because I, I really want to touch on the point that you make around how do we inspire people during a difficult change time? Um, and how did yeah. you go about that inspiration piece? Yeah, for me, it's a lot about how you help them to develop those new competencies and to 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 change the way they position themselves in the organization. So what we've done is uh, we offered um, dedicated developmental program for those, those first line managers that were based on um, an external facilitator who observed them into mm -hmm. their daily job, gave them actionable feedback and followed up with them on how they can actually uh, implement that feedback and really on the job learning was really important. And I think that was the most impactful uh, learning activity we've done to actually have this uh, f immediate feedback on what you do and how it will be different in the new organization. So that was one thing we've done. And then the other thing is that we um, also created some peer learning, so group learning together, where they could share their frustration or share what they've tested, what's not working, what's working. And again, you know, having this constant conversation with us around, okay, maybe we've moved too fast on that part. Maybe we've been too slow on this part. Can we pause here? Can we accelerate? And we are really following their guidance with the transformation on, okay, uh, making sure the reason was okay for this population. What's important is that a transformation like this will never work if you only support the managers. You really need to develop all individuals in the organization. And for example, in the past, we had leadership programs that were only for managers. What we've done is we looked at the content of this leadership program and we looked at what part were necessary for every individual in the organization in the new in the targeted structure. So because we won't have controlling managers, it means people need to be more uh, autonomous. They need to be able to self-led themselves. They need to be able to set their own priorities. So we delivered, for example, effective communication, mm -hmm. uh, self-leadership program, time management program to all individuals with more than six months in the organization. So we really took what was in the past uh, only um, for leaders mm -hmm. to actually deliver it to the to the total population to make sure everybody was actually um, evolving in their competencies and developing themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think the two things are really important. And often when I speak to leaders in other organizations, they forget that part. So they develop new leaders, but then the population <laughs> doesn't evolve. <laughs> so the, you still have employees who want uh, a management um, uh, position above them because they have not developed the competencies to be able to self-lead themselves. So that part is, is super important, I think. I love that because I, I'm of the view that in a lot of manager and leadership programs, the biggest challenge we do face is that nobody knows how to act you know, beyond just the leader. And then the yeah. leader sits there and says, but, you know, I've been trained, but the other, you know, 20, 25 people that I look after, they haven't been trained. So I can't influence that you know, enough um, as part of that. So I definitely think this notion of, I think, firstly, really, really listening, because that's a theme that comes out for me quite strongly in terms of the, your whole journey, you know, listening to feedback, gathering input, being bold about the fact that people can say what is really frustrating us being bold about the fact to admit sometimes we move too quickly. Sometimes we might have done yeah. things in the wrong way. How can we fix that together? I think that really stands out about a very different way of thinking about change and change journeys in general. Claire, let's talk about today. Let's talk about what yeah. is, where are you today? What does success look like? And I'd love to understand how did you define this future state from a, a success point of view? And how did you, how did you communicate that to the audience? Yeah. 
So we are a set of organizations, so we love targets. Um, and uh, we had set some clear measurable targets uh, to measure the success of this project, of this transformation. One was around the employee engagement. So we use the employee and net promoter score mm -hmm. as, a, as a tool in our organization. So we saw an improvement on that because we moved from 25 roughly to 64. Wow. So massive improvement on that. We also looked at the progress on net promoter score, so our customer feedback. Again, we've seen some progress here on on, on the on the numbers of, uh, I mean, on the value uh, on how our customers score our experience. We also set some targets on productivity, and we we are now able to achieve productivity levels, sorry, that were never achieved before in the history of that country. And we also set some targets on OP conversion ratio, so the, the, the classic operating profit uh, targets. And we were also able to shift from being loss making to being profit making. So all those targets have seen progress and we are really pleased with that. You interview me at the right time because actually last week I had uh, my leadership conference and I asked the leaders of the organization to do a SWOT of our current organizational design. Mm -hmm. So what's working, what's not working. And I also asked the question, should we move back? You know, mm -hmm. should we, are we happy with what we've done? Is it, has it delivered on the promises that we said four years ago? Are you satisfied with it? And I was very surprised that none of them said we should go back. All of them are very happy with the structure we have now, which is a, a lot more um, uh, distributed in terms of governance and uh, taking decision. And uh, of course, we have things to improve. We need to make progress on some elements, but uh, the, the overall uh, benefits are clearly uh, bigger than uh, we expected. Um, I do think that um, it's particularly interesting to look at how you remain agile with organizational design, especially in a VUCA environment. So during COVID, for example, we paused at some point the transformation and uh, because we needed to address the first emergency. Then once we had done that, we accelerated the transformation because actually we thought it's a very specific moment in time. Let's do that. And then in 2021, where it was very uncertain for people because of all the crisis uh, mix, we said maybe it's a time where we need more intense leadership. So maybe we actually take a lot of control back again for a certain period of time because we need to secure people. And then now we can let go a bit uh, again and make sure that it's more distributed. So this agility is super important. And personally, I have to say, I don't think I've been really good at it because I really was afraid that we would go back to a controlling environment. So I was afraid of having this uh, flexibility in the model, but now I'm much more comfortable with it. I mean, we, we've had so many crises that have seen the experience that we can actually uh, re being more flexible around this. So yeah, it's an important point. No, yeah. I agree. I think definitely around acknowledging also what's happening in the external world at the time, I think is such an important thing. And, and often my criticism against organizational design processes is that it's this black box that nobody really understands <laughs> what's happening and then ta -da, we announce something, you know, this is what yeah. the future is going to look like. I love the fact that you were open enough to say, you know, the world with the pandemic at the time is now different. We need a different component, a different behavior, a different leader in this particular situation. So that whole situational leadership component coming to the fore, however, not giving up on the principles of why you started this and where the core behaviors needs to come from. And I think that's sometimes something we forget to do is to really acknowledge but what is the core? What sits at the core of, of our organization? What is it that who we want to become yeah. from an identity point of view? And I think the different paths that can lead us there um, is definitely going to be different. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's all about asking two simple questions. Are we still serving in the best possible way our customers in the current economic uh, condition? And how are we actually creating the best experience for our people? And I do think that if you listen and it's the truth, I think, for many organizations, if you listen to employees, a lot of them six months ago, for example, said, we feel insecure. There is Ukrainian invasion. There is potentially a high inflation in some country. I need security. I need to make sure that my leadership team has a clear direction. And in this time, it's super important to have maybe to engage more in daily activity and it's not that you would take control, but mm. maybe give less room for flexibility or freedom of action because people need a bit of security. And once you set up clear framework, you can give that freedom again. But I think it's, it's super important to respond to that need 
uh, and it's, it's not easy to do, but um, it's something that uh, I aim to do better for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it does require quite a bit of maturity in the organization, right? I mean, I think firstly around that there's enough level or um, adequate levels of trust that we can have these types of conversations openly, um, that we can have this notion around the fact that, you know, for now, where we are in this situation, I have to take ownership and be accountable for the call that I'm going to make. Um, yeah. You know, I think that's such an important thing because I think a lot of people get stuck with the fact that um, including people and listening to people does not mean that you 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 have to drive consensus at times. At times you have to no. make the difficult call <laughs> and you have to be able to stand up to say, I've now listened to what you've said, but this is now what we are going to do. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important when facing difficult change circumstances, um, which, yeah. which sounds like you, you'd had at the time. And something that I think all leaders learn on the journey is that you won't please everybody and you're not here to make friends. You know, sometimes you will make unpopular decisions. It's about how you explain them, mm. how you give context to your decision and how you are open for feedback and recognize that it may not be the best decision. Maybe we will we will do it differently in the future, but someone had to make a decision and with the information that you had at the moment and uh, the possible options you've had, this is the best decision you could make, you know? And I do think that this humility and being open to discuss that is essential to really engage our people on the long term and so they can keep coming with feedback mm. over and over again to help your organization progress. Mm. And I think that I, I love that. I've always thought, and you know, one of my mentors also taught me around the fact that make the best possible decision that you can with the information that you have available at a particular point in time. Exactly. If new information <laughs> becomes available and you see that, hang on, oh, I'm not going in the right direction. There is nothing wrong with then saying, you know, given what I now know, we should take a different step. And I think that's such a big learning for a lot of leaders when they ever they engage in a transformation process. Claire, as we start to wrap up, Give us some advice. There's a lot of HR professionals, a lot of leaders listening to this podcast today. Where do we start? And what are some of those first things that we need to do if we want to embark on a, on a similar journey? Yeah. So it's, first of all, I have to be honest, it's a, it's a tough journey, you know, transformation. It requires a lot of energy and there will be moments of doubt. So my first advice is to really build your very strong belief around the need for change and uh, different ways of doing things. And for me, that starts with yourself. So really spend sufficient time developing yourself, challenging your own belief, maybe with a peer or with a coach, it doesn't, whatever works for you, but being really sure why you prepare to do all these efforts. And are you really convinced this is the right direction for the organization? Because I've been tested many times mm. during this, this transformation. And honestly, I think if I wouldn't have been 200% convinced myself, I would have let go probably 10 times and we wouldn't, wouldn't be where we are today. And I do think this is really the most important advice I can give is really take the sufficient time before you start to really work on this, make sure you are 100% convinced and make sure you can also uh, get people enthusiastic when you share that conviction with them. Mm. So speak with your heart, you know, really be uh, honest uh, about your belief and uh, why it makes you enthusiastic to want to drive that transformation. Mm. I think that's such good advice because I often think, you know, a lot of um, change journeys fail because the leaders leading them kind of are not a hundred percent in their personal capacity. No, I, I sometimes refer to it as, and it's a horrible word, but corridor terrorism, where in the room we agree. <laughs> yeah. And then in the corridor outside, all of a sudden these things pop up to say, mm, I don't really mm, think yeah. we're going to get this done, right? I, don't, I, I have my own doubts. So I think that notion of really building your own belief first, really making sure that you are on board, inspiring people, listening to people throughout this journey and then being able to drive corrective actions and new opportunities as we shift and as we move through. I think that's definitely an important thing for everybody on today's podcast to take with them um, as they move forward. Claire, last question from my side. What does the future hold? What does that look ah. like for you along this journey? Yeah, so continuous improvement. You know, having this constant, honest feedback conversation around uh, what's working, what's not working, how do we adjust to market condition because we enter very uncertain market condition now. So we need to be specifically agile and specifically listening to our staff around this. And then the other thing is um, being disciplined as well, you know, with mm -hmm. what we've agreed as our key principle, because it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to take the wrong direction if you don't remember why you do it. So purpose is key. Mm -hmm. And for us, that's, that's a key challenge for next year to make sure that 
whatever we decide when we decide to evolve or, or when we decide to change maybe uh, some some elements of our culture or elements of our organizational design that we remain really aligned to our purpose and that we actually uh, uh, keep our key uh, operating principle in mind that's super important for us no, I think definitely clear. And I think from today's conversation, what I'm definitely taking away is, again, the importance of purpose. Be clear on the purpose. Be very, very clear on your why. Make sure that you are personally convinced that this is the direction where we need to go to. Be very brave around the way that you talk about it and do not shy away from employee feedback. You know, I always feel if people spend energy to tell you what's not working, at least they're spending energy. It means that they are interested. It means they want to be part of the solution. I'm also taking away today that change is not done to people, but it's actually done with people. Yeah. And in those engagements and in those conversations, we need to have grace both with ourselves as the leader, but also with employees at that particular point. And a very interesting thing that you mentioned that I think a lot of HR professionals need to take a note of is it's not only about equipping and training the leaders, it's actually about equipping the employees aligned to particular principles of the behaviors that we do want to see, and then helping them understand through the stories that we tell, how are we going to get there and what does the future look like for us? And then I think celebrating in the success of the organization when we do get there. Claire, from my side, thank you very, very much for sharing your experience with us and uh, congratulations on a, on a wonderful journey. And I wish you all the best for you and the organization into the future. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you. Thank you.